So when I went away to school, I went to a small liberal arts college outside of New York City that was as far away from the San Francisco Bay Area where I grew up as I could get. And when I say it was a small liberal arts college, it was tiny. There was only a thousand, just a little over a thousand students. I was a theater major and I quickly fell into a really cool crowd of friends. We would stay up late. We were not smoking dope, but maybe some cigarettes <laughs> and doing improv jams. Later, I would walk home in the cold New York night, get into my room, grab the phone from the middle of the room and drag it as close as I could to my bed, pull the coiled cord of the receiver up to my face, pull the covers over my head and call my mom and cry and cry and cry. I was wicked homesick. And this went on for months. And, you know, initially my mom was very sympathetic and definitely, you know, oh, I'm so sorry, sweetie, things like that. And then eventually she started talking about things about going on at work or going on in her life. And I kept thinking, what is wrong with her? Why doesn't she miss me as much as I miss her? <laughs> this went on for some time. But eventually I started to feel a little less homesick. And I wasn't calling home quite as much. I had finally landed a role in a play. It was being produced by an off-Broadway director. It was very exciting. So things were looking up. And it was the Friday night before, um, I'm gonna back up. <laughs> so I wanna explain a little bit more about this homesickness thing and my mom. And so from when I was 12 until I went away to school, it was just the two of us. My dad had left, um, my brother and sister were away at college, and kind of secretly, it's what I had wanted. My mom and I were a lot alike. We were really close. Um, we just kind of drifted well together. Um, she was also, I was the baby, last of three. You know, she was single mom, working, and she was tired. And that meant I kind of had a lot of free reign. I came and went as I wanted to, as long as I was safe and I checked in, it was totally cool. My brother and sister liked to tell me I had a totally different parent than they had. And so I had a lot of freedom and she kind of, she kind of embraced and celebrated that freedom. But she was also kind of a badass. My mom had been a political activist since I could remember. She and a bunch of mothers started a school in East Palo Alto. They called themselves the Mothers for Equal Education. And then on a whim in her 40s, she decided to go to law school. And she became a criminal defense attorney. And she took cases that everybody thought were hopeless. She specialized in juvenile offenders. She even, she even represented a pot farmer. Um, yep. Yeah, and that earned me all kinds of credit with my friends that, yeah, your mom is a badass. So on the one hand, it made sense that I missed her because we had this close relationship and I looked up to her. But on the other hand, given how independent I'd been, I came and went as I wanted to, it didn't make sense. So now we can fast forward to the, this part where I'm talking about not being quite as homesick and landing the play. And so it was the Friday night before the opening night of the, the play, and we were exhausted. We'd been working, it was dress rehearsal. We'd been working super late into the night, and I finally was crawling back home in that cold, it was February, cold New York night. It was dark, and slushy snow, and I don't even remember falling asleep. I was asleep before my head even hit the pillow. In the middle of the night, I woke up with a start. There was a phone ringing in, right outside my room in the hall. And I remember thinking, that's for me, and it's not good news. I ran out to the hall, and I picked up the phone, and they said to call home that there had been an emergency. I raced back in my room, and I called home, and a woman answered the phone. And I said, Mom, Mom, who is it? And the woman answered, Martha. It's Aunt Becky. It's your mom. No, not my mom. My brain raced through all the people it could be, all the people in my life it could be, but not her, not my mom. 
At the same time that I was in my dress rehearsal, my mom was leaving work. She went to an ATM and deposited a couple checks. And when she got in her car, a man had gotten into the back seat and abducted her. We don't really know what happened for about an hour and a half, but about an hour and a half later, people noticed a struggle in the car at another ATM down the road. My mom floored the gas, crashed the car into traffic. The man ran out of the back seat. She came out of the driver's seat, grabbing her chest. She'd been stabbed, and she fell to the ground and died in the street with strangers. My mom had been murdered. There are no words to describe what that felt like. It almost felt as if the universe had packed a punch so hard in my stomach that it shot me straight out of my body. I don't remember anything. Things were blurry. But when I came back to it, it was the next morning. And my housemates decided I was going to go meet my sister and we were going to fly back to California. My housemates decided that I needed to eat. Internally, I was not so sure this was such a great idea. On the one hand, I felt starving. On the other hand, I thought I was going to vomit. But either way, I went along with it. I had a housemate on either side. I was looking at the back of my roommate's head. And we got into the cafeteria. And it was loud Saturday morning, lots of clanging dishes, people talking really loud, the sicky, sweet smell of syrup and bacon and eggs. You know what I'm talking about, right? And we got about halfway in, and everything went real quiet. And I heard this quiet whispering. And I took a few more steps. And then I realized they were whispering about me. There she goes. There's the girl whose mother was murdered. In my small liberal arts college, overnight, it had spread like wildfire. Everyone knew. My housemates got me out of there, and I remember leaning up against the cold outside wall of the cafeteria thinking to myself, I am not going to be the girl whose mother was murdered, nor is my mom's extraordinary life going to be defined by how she was taken. What I didn't realize is I made a second decision, that by not talking about the trauma, by not talking about what happened, I really couldn't talk about her. I wound it up, and I buried it. We got back to California, they couldn't find him. There was no fingerprints, he had vanished. All that was left in the back of my mom's crash car was a paisley baseball cap, and on that cap was a single hair, and on that hair was a follicle that they extracted DNA from. Well, they ran that DNA through the system and there was no matches. So the investigators took all the evidence, they threw it in a drawer and slammed it shut, and that was it. Over 300 people came to my mom's memorial. They talked about all the things she had done in the community, how she had helped people, how she cared for people that nobody else seemed to care for, what an extraordinary person she was. I could not be moved. They didn't know her. They didn't know me. They didn't know that I didn't know how I was actually going to survive now that the center of my universe had been taken from me. Needless to say, I did not go back to that smaller Bards college where everybody knew my story. No. I channeled my rage and my anger and became an environmental activist. I was going to save the species. I was going to be the voice for the species that nobody cared about. This eventually led me to maybe go back and get my undergraduate and my master's and my PhD, still with a conservation passion. But now I was interested in using genetic tools to address these conservation questions. I would look at the DNA of the species throughout the species range and try and figure out how different individuals were related to each other so I could better conserve and protect them. I used the DNA from the species I cared about to tell their stories. All this time through my undergrad, my master's, my PhD, my professors, my advisors, my colleagues, my lab mates, nobody knew. No one knew who she was, what had happened to me. I took all of that and tightly wound it and buried it as deep as I could. Towards the end of my PhD, I got a phone call. 
the investigator had actually opened up that cold cl case file drawer and ran the DNA and they had a match. It was a man serving a life sentence in Texas. All of a sudden, front page of the newspaper, all in the same area where I grew up, where I got my master's and my PhD. It was in the news in the evening. All of a sudden, everybody knew. Everybody knew, and it was all about how she was taken and not about her life. Cold case murder solved 17 years later. It was like I was right back in that cafeteria with the hushed whispers, the sicky sweet smell, and wanting to vomit. The trial took many months. Eventually, he confessed, and he was found guilty. But the next stage was the sentencing hearing, and the prosecution was seeking the death penalty. Well, my mom was a political activist, and she was anti-death penalty. Um, she didn't believe in it. She had worked very hard against it. And so my sister and I felt, despite other members of my family absolutely not agreeing with us, my sister and I felt that it was very important for us to go to the sentencing hearing, address the judge, and beg for mercy for this man who had killed our mother. Well, I had defended a dissertation. I kind of knew how to talk to authority. I'd had a little experience doing that in the past. I had this in the bag. I had three succinct points that I was going to make that would be just perfect that this judge would hear and this man wouldn't get the death penalty and then I would have stood up and honored this woman that had meant so much to me. So we arrived to the courtroom. I had my three bulleted points on a piece of paper and we opened up the door and a wave of stale, nervous sweat smell hit me in the face. My mouth went dry, and I could hear my paper rattling from my shaking hand. And we walked in, and everybody was facing the judge, including the man who had killed my mom. I was looking at the back of his head, and I was looking at the judge. And people are asking me, like, what did you feel? I can't answer that question. I, I felt nothing. I felt something. I don't know but I was looking at the man who had taken so much from me, but only the back. As I looked at him, I looked down at my piece of paper, bracing myself to make my points, defend this, defend to speak for my mom, just like I had defended my dissertation. And when I looked down, it was blank. It was blurry. I'd had a blind panic. Here I was at the most important point in my life where I was going to actually stand up and speak for the woman whose voice had been silenced, and I had nothing. I felt my sister to my right. I looked at the judge. I looked at the back of the man's head, and then I started to talk. It took me a while to figure out what I was even saying, but it was definitely not the three points I had made. But what I did say was the story of my mom. I talked about her sense of humor. I talked about how she always believed every single human had light and good, that every person deserved a second chance, that she would have defended someone just like him. I talked about what she meant to me. I talked about how we communicated without even talking, that she was my best friend, that we called ourselves the survivors. In this process of telling the story of my mother, and my sister next went and told her story from her perspective, we talked about who she was, what she wanted, and that we, we begged the judge to, to listen to these words and listen to the voice of our mother. The judge went back into his room to deliberate. And we sat there, and I think at that point I probably did come into my body and realize the enormity of what was going on. And when he came back, he said that based on the family's words, he could not give the death penalty to this man, that he would have life without parole. So our words 
had made that difference. But what's more significant to me than any of that is that little piece of DNA, that little chunk of DNA, the DNA that I use to conserve species, that little piece of DNA allowed me to uncoil and unravel the story of my mother. For the first time in my life, I was able to talk about this extraordinary, badass woman I was lucky enough to call my mom. Thank you. <laughs>